Hello, I'm Neil Quigley and welcome to the latest episode of my blogcast. Hope you're well and you've had a good couple of weeks. A couple of Fridays ago, I went to the theatre with my girlfriend. It was her birthday present. She really wanted to see this particular play because it starred Sir Ian McKellen. She'd seen him before a few years ago do his one-man stage show where he's just telling stories. And she said that was brilliant, but she'd not actually seen him perform in anything. Neither had I. I'd never seen him live on stage at all. She gave me lots of hints that she really wanted to see this production. So I took on board those hints and bought her some tickets as her present to go along and see the show in the West End. It was at the Noel Coward Theatre, which was the same place where we saw the motif and the cue. Congratulations to Mark Gatiss on winning the Olivier Award for Best Actor in a Play recently. He was fantastic playing Sir John Gilgood in that one. As at the moment, I'm not drinking alcohol and I am a celiac, therefore I am gluten free. They sell free down there, which is a gluten free, non alcoholic beer. So my refreshments for the night were sorted. I finally managed to work out the Delphont and Macintosh Theatre app and managed to pre order not only the pre theatre drink, but also our interval drinks as well. So that took out all the queuing at the bar before and at the interval, because I am not a fan of queuing. The play that Sir Ian McKellen was starring in was The Player Kings, which was a combination of Henry IV, parts one and two, the famous Shakespeare play. I had not seen this one before, but it is based on true facts and history, so I was kind of at least slightly aware of the story. So Ian was playing the role of full staff. There was quite a modern feel to the production with the way it was done. It was made to feel very up to date by the costumes that they put the actors in, the style of music that accompanied it, and the general setting and sound effects as well. It was very cleverly done. The words of Shakespeare, but a very modern feel to it that made it feel quite up-to-date and current, which I thought was very clever. It being not only one Shakespeare play, but two Shakespeare plays put together, and as you can imagine, it was quite a long performance, so it actually started at 6.30pm, so I had to dash there from work to get there on time. In the end, I made it with about 15 minutes to spare, so that was fantastic. Had time to pick up our pre-ordered drinks and find our seats. I did manage to get us a couple of decent seats in the stalls as well, so we had a great view of proceedings. The show itself was fantastic. The whole cast were amazing. Quite a few famous and well-known lines in Henry the Fourth Parts 1 and 2. You know in Family Guy where they go to a movie and Peter gets excited when they say the name of the movie in the film? It's similar to that when they say a line in Shakespeare that I'm actually aware of. Although I celebrate internally, not out loud, I promise. I think a sign of a good performance is how quickly it goes, which is quite sad, but also means you're really enjoying it. The first half flew by and it was the interval in no time, so it seemed. I thoroughly enjoyed the performance of everyone, particularly Sir Ian in the first half. He was brilliant. As you probably would have guessed, part one was Henry IV, part one. Then we had the interval. Then after that, and another can of free down for me and a wine for Linda, we headed back to our seats to enjoy Henry IV, part two. That, of course, was equally as good, and it actually seemed to go quicker than part one. I couldn't believe it when it was the end of the night. When they started coming out for their bows, I was like, that can't be it already, surely. I've only been here about 25 minutes. An hour and a half, I've actually been sat through that second half, which just shows you how good and engaging it was. Delighted to have seen Sir Ian McKellen on stage. He was everything you'd imagine him to be. Absolutely fantastic. Although I did feel a little bit sorry for him 
It's two plays in one. It's a long performance. He's in lots of scenes. He's 84 years old. Not only that, they made him wear lots of padded for his character and he got to drink plenty of liquid throughout the performance as well. So they're certainly working him hard. As you can imagine, it did get a deserved standing ovation at the end. And I had a very happy girlfriend who got to see something she really wanted to. We both had a fantastic time. And obviously I scored some brownie points for getting those tickets. The night after the Player Kings, we were invited to the evening reception for my second cousin Beth's wedding. I have mentioned this before, but I do come from a huge family. My mum has lots of sisters. My dad has lots of brothers and sisters. They have all had kids. Most of their kids have had kids. And now their kids' kids have had kids. The family is basically getting out of control. So as you can imagine, going along there, it was nice to catch up with lots of my family. The bride and groom both looked amazing and the event which was held over in Marlow was perfectly staged. It was really good. They had a DJ who I know they booked before for their functions who was really good and from my point of view it was nice to be on the other side of things. I have done countless wedding discos over the years so it's quite nice to see someone else do it and see someone doing it so well. Now I know I said the family is big and growing I also got to catch up with one of my cousins who is also now pregnant. So there's going to be another member of the family as well. So that is very exciting. I was the designated driver once again because I'm not drinking alcohol at the moment. So I did actually volunteer to do that. They had lots of nice little touches there, including a pick and mix which I would say was meant to be for the children. But there was not that many children there, and there were certainly lots of adults taking advantage of it. Now, Linda, I barely see her eat chocolate. I have never seen her have any sweets whatsoever. She rarely has desserts. Basically, what I'm saying is, genuinely, she has not really got a sweet tooth. However, when she spotted this pick and mix, she got strangely excited. I think it probably reminded her of being a little girl, going into Woolworths and maybe being given a bag of sweets as a special treat. I, even after she'd spotted the pick and mix section and got excited about it, did not expect her to do anything else apart from acknowledge it. I was wrong on this occasion. She did wander over, she got herself the paper bag and she started filling it up with various sweets, flying saucers, jellied sweets, cola bottles, that kind of thing. We then walked away. She ate everything in her paper bag, which just left me almost standing open-mouthed. As I said, she doesn't do sweets. If she has any chocolate, it'll only be a small little square at a time. So this was very unusual, to say the least. And then she surprised me further by getting another half a bag of sweets. She was enjoying herself and seemed fine, no problem. Although later that night, she did have a bit of a sugar crash and feel very tired when we got home. And I think she had a sugar hangover the next day. She didn't feel too great and she didn't drink that much alcohol. So I suspect it was all down to her having a lot more sugar than she would normally have. She probably had more sugar in one day than she's had since she was about 10. The other fun thing they had at the wedding was one of those photo booth machines that you do tend to see quite a bit at events and occasions these days. Now, I absolutely love having my picture taken. I don't have to be asked twice. As soon as I see a camera, I'm smiling, I'm posing, I'm trying to get my head in the right angle. I'm trying to sort out the lighting that I'm in. Love it. My girlfriend, however, not so keen on having her picture taken. I was trying to convince her that we should go and have one taken. I mean, they have obviously all the fancy dress items and inflatable guitars, microphones, feather boas, big glasses. I knew I wasn't going to get her to do anything like that. So I thought, let's just go over and have a nice straight photo with each other to mark the fact we've been at the event, it'll be a nice little keepsake. I was getting very little success in trying to persuade her. Then 
my auntie Sue came over and she was a little bit more forceful than me. She decided that everyone had to have their picture taken and virtually dragged Linda over there. So we did get a photo done in the end. It was very nice. I was impressed with how good a picture they take. And it is still a bit like an old school photo booth, although it's touchscreen and there's someone there helping you to make sure you look the right way. The lighting is good and you have to wait while it develops and then you get to pick up your picture from a dispenser at the side. It was a really good photo, I thought, and I've let her keep the original version. So that was a great night and I got to drive us home in Linda's Volvo once again given me more practice in driving an electric car. I don't know if you've ever driven one. They're quite weird and I don't know if they're all the same as the Volvo. This one, like I believe all electric cars, is automatic. So you've only got the two pedals. But the weird thing about it is it's a bit like driving a bumper car in that you accelerate by putting your foot down. Now, as soon as you take your foot off the accelerator or lift it up a bit, the car starts to slow down really quickly, decelerates really quickly. So you hardly need to use your brake when you're driving along. Although you will be relieved to hear what happens is if you do take your foot off the accelerator and decelerate, that automatically puts the brake lights on so people behind can see you're slowing down. So it's all safe from that point of view. But it was good fun. I'm even getting slightly better at parking it the more I drive it. Well, I think I am. Linda kind of disagrees still. Last weekend was one of my favourite weekends of the year and something that has been a stable, pun intended, annual event for many, many years now. Linda and I went up to Aintree for the Grand National Festival. The main reason I do this is my mate Jeff Nolan lives there. Me and Jeff met in 2000 when we were both working for Mix 96, the radio station in Ellsbury. We became friends during that period. We've stayed friends ever since. I've been up to Liverpool so many times and he always went to Ladies' Day at Aintree, which is on the Friday. He used to talk to me about it and say how great it was. Eventually, I managed to go up one year and I've been going back every year since. What we tend to do is go up on the Thursday afternoon, the day before Ladies' Day. Linda and I found this amazing apartment that we stayed at last year and managed to rebook again for this year. It's the billiard room apartments of a massive house on Beach Lawn in Crosby. And it was actually built, the original house, when it was actually all one accommodation by the man who started the White Star Line shipping company. They are famous for the Titanic. That was one of theirs. And the son of the guy who built the house, who grew up in it briefly until the age of nine, he was actually in charge of the company when the Titanic was launched and he actually survived. He was on board and he survived the sinking of the Titanic. The surname is Ismay. Look him up, it's quite a fascinating story. The way the house is positioned is looking over the River Mersey as it heads out towards the sea. Now, every time one of the White Star Line ships went past, the captain had to salute the house. When we were sitting in the apartment at night, you could hear these big boats coming from quite a way away and they're quite well lit up. So you could actually see them when you were looking out the front window disappear along the Mersey and pass you. I would like to think those captains are still saluting. I saluted back every time one went past. As I said, we arrived on the Thursday. We let the train take the strain. Then we went out for a fantastic dinner at a place, again, we found the year before called Tapas Tapas. I think you can understand exactly what type of food they have in there. Last year, we did kind of their taster menu and we had a tiny bit of their paella. It was so good, we already knew that we wanted to go back and have the whole thing. So we knew what our dinner was going to be. We went in there and ordered the paella 
for two, which I must say was a huge serving. I mean, we did have a starter as well, mainly because they cook it from scratch and cook it fresh. So if you do order that from the menu, it's about a 45 minute wait, which was fine. We did know that, but we thought, oh, we'll get a starter in the meantime. And then when the actual main came out, it was so big. Obviously you both share it, but I hate leaving anything on my plate, but I honestly could not finish it. There was so much. So we did the only thing we could do, because I cannot leave food, we politely asked if maybe they had a box they could put in and we could take the rest home. They happily did that and we did take it home and I actually had it for my supper the following night. It was gorgeous. We then just had a few drinks with Jeff in a pub down the road so I could have a good catch up with him. Then we sensibly got an earliest night before Ladies' Day on the Friday the following day. As with any big horse racing event, it's a good excuse to put a suit on and dress up smart. I bought a new suit especially for this year's event. I got it online, which is always a bit of a risk, but I got it from somewhere where I really do trust the sizes and luckily it all fitted perfectly. So I was quite excited about giving that suit its first outing. It was a bit of a different colour for what I would normally go for. I managed to coordinate my tie with Linda's dress. So we complemented each other perfectly. We headed round to Jeff's first of all to grab some breakfast and have a couple of drinks there. Then we got a taxi to Aintree Racecourse. Get it in there just about in time for the first race. It was very busy with big queues getting in and of course we had to stop for the traditional photos the same photos in the same areas we've been taking for about the last 15 years but it has to be done so we can record it on the facebook and compare years as they go by as we were walking into the section that we were going to be watching the racing from i saw someone i knew somebody i used to work with at a radio station in yeovil called Ivel fm she now works for itv news she was there doing a bit of work to be honest so i walked past her and she was actually doing a piece to camera at that point obviously i didn't interrupt i am a professional in these situations but she just stopped to have a quick chat to her cameraman stroke producer and i took that opportunity just to very quickly say hello and see how she was doing. Then I left her in peace to get on with her job, which she did brilliantly, of course. Although, bizarrely, as it happened, one of Jeff's girlfriend's friends saw the ITV News that day. And during Amy Lewis's report, you can actually see Jeff and his girlfriend walk past. Annoyingly, I managed not to get onto the TV, which was a bit frustrating. So we got to watch the races. I had a few bets. In between the races, depending on where you are around the course, they either have a live band on or have some DJs. There was lots and lots going on besides the actual horse racing itself. Everybody dresses up. The atmosphere is fantastic. We tend to try and move around and see as many of the different areas as we possibly can. We actually found our way into a new bar this time, the McCoy Bar, which was very nice. Had a look around there. That was very civilised. That's kind of where we finished up. I did actually get out onto the course to watch a couple of the races, which I do love doing. It is such a challenging race course. The way it's set up for National Weekend is amazing. And on the Friday, they do run one of the races over the actual Grand National course. Because we are very experienced and have been doing this for years, we know it is kind of best to miss the last race and head out and try and get a taxi back. So we did just that. We managed to get one by walking about seven or eight minutes down the road and got a taxi back into Crosby where we were staying. While in the taxi, I thought I'd just have a bet on the last race that we were missing. There was a horse running called El Jeff. It was 40 to 1, but I thought ah, it might be a sign. Pick it on Jeff's name, give it a go. Stuck a fiver on it, thought no more of it. Then we went off to one bar to have a couple of drinks before moving to another bar down the road. It was while we were there that Jeff comes to me and says someone had told him that 
El Jeff had won that last race at 40 to 1. Now, I told him in the taxi on the way out of Aintree that was the horse I was betting on, and I told him why. So I thought maybe he was winding me up, because that's the sort of thing I would have probably done to him. So I went on my phone to double check, and sure enough, he was not winding me up. El Jeff did win the last race at 40 to 1, so I managed to win myself about £230, which more than paid for the day. So that was a right result. Then, as is the tradition, we went back to Jeff's for pizza and to listen to music for a couple of hours before calling it a night. Always such a fantastic day. It's so much fun and we're already looking forward to going to Aintree for Ladies Day next year. Of course, that is not even the main event of the weekend. The main event is the Grand National. Now, I've never been to Aintree on Grand National Day, but the tradition is we always watch the race somewhere in a pub in Liverpool. Jeff had been very organised this year and booked us the table at one of the pubs near to him called Inside Number 4, which we'd been to before and I know is a great place. So I had a small matter of watching Tottenham Hotspur play first. We went to see that game at Marines Ground, because that was just round the corner, in a bar area, which actually my club Tottenham Hotspur in effect paid for because it was paid for and built using money they made from the FA Cup game that Tottenham played against Marine during Covid in which basically we gave them the money that they would have made from tickets if they had been able to sell them for that game. So it felt like an apt place to watch the game from. It was a bit of a shame that Tottenham played absolutely terrible and got thrashed by Newcastle United. So that did put a little bit of a dampener on my weekend. Once the football was over, attention turned totally to the horse racing, and we went and got our pre-booked table that Jeff had organised. His parents and his sister were also there, so it was great to catch up with them as well. We had a nice chat whilst watching the racing. Then it was time to properly gather around the TV for the National. Now, I have a bet on the National every year. I follow horse racing quite closely. I still think it is one of the hardest races to predict, even though the favourite did win it this year, which is quite unusual. It was a very exciting race. There were moments where I thought I might have a chance with some of the horses I had picked. I think backing one horse in the Grand National is too risky because any of them could make a mistake and fall or unseat their rider. So I normally do three or four horses for every Grand National. This year, none of them finished in a high enough position to get me any money. Jeff, however, did pick the winner, so well done to him. But he's last of the big spenders, so I think he had a pound on it. So he did get just about his money and a bit more back. So he was perfectly happy with that, happy to say that he had the winner. And because they'd moved the Grand National a little bit earlier this year, there were two more races to watch. So we watched those in the pub. Then we all said goodbye. Jeff and his girlfriend and their children went home, as did his parents. Linda and I stayed in the bar we were in to get some food. I had a chat to them. Their menu looked very clearly marked gluten-free. And I spoke to them and they were fantastic. They suggested what they could do gluten-free and supplied me with a brilliant free course meal, which included the biggest piece of gluten-free sticky toffee pudding I think I have ever seen, which I gratefully ate. It was fantastic. A nice way to round off Grand National Day. Sunday was basically travelling home day, so we got up and left our wonderful apartment and slowly made our way into Liverpool city centre. We had quite a bit of time to kill before the train home, so we went for a nice walk round and then had dinner at Miller and Carter at Albert Docks, which did mean I had another three-course gluten-free meal, which was fantastic. Then it was time to get the train home and call it close to another great weekend. I'm already looking forward to next year. I had an asthma checkup with one of the nurses at my local practice recently. I was diagnosed as asthmatic when I was about six or seven And one of the main triggers when I was younger used to be exercise and cut grass. And as I played a lot of football, as you could imagine, that was quite the issue. Generally, touch wood, my asthma has been quite well managed over the years, 
always using the same two inhalers, a brown one and a blue one. Recently, I've been noticing I've been getting a little bit more wheezy and I'm thinking maybe my asthma might need looking at again, which is why I ended up going to see the nurse. She, after a long chat to me, decided that we might try a new inhaler. So I'm in the middle of trialing a brand new inhaler, which seems very weird after using the same one forever. I'm in the middle of the trial at the moment, and I'll be honest, I'm not totally sure if it's working or not. Some moments I feel slightly better, than I did with my old inhaler regime. Some minutes I feel slightly worse. I'm going to go with her plan, which was give it the six weeks, then we'll review it and see how we are then. Just a reminder that you can hear my radio show Saturday afternoons between two and four at radio9springs.com. That is it for now. Look after yourselves and each other. Have fun and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.